All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Right before we do, a couple announcements. Make sure that you guys uh, have read your VX659 studies. I found a couple of them by the printer in the next room because we're doing this all over again tomorrow. And if I don't have a voice, you guys are going to lead the conversation. So today we are talking about targeted temperature management post cardiac arrest. This has been in the in the literature a lot recently, um, and so you may see some questions on it coming up in boards. The main things that I want to cover today are just understanding how targeted temperature management kind of came into being, the idea behind it, the theories behind why hypothermia works, and then the history of how we've done hypothermia protocols and any new developments that are coming out. The basic things I want you to understand after this is done is how to cool your patients, what temperature you should be cooling them at, how long you need to cool them, if rhythms make any difference, and if there's any benefit to cooling patients before they arrive at the hospital versus waiting to initiate your targeted temperature management once they're in the hospital. So this is a topic that I find really interesting dating all the way back to my childhood. This is Michigan. As I've told you guys before, I'm from this part of Michigan, which most people think is either part of northern Wisconsin or part of Canada, but it's actually further north than 70% of the population of Canada, which is down here by Toronto and Ontario. Um, Things are a little bit different up there. Last week, for example, this is a neighborhood shirts versus skins game of hockey in someone's backyard because they were excited that the temperature got into the single digits on the positive side. But going back to the superior shore of Upper Michigan, right here where I'm from, they have a dog sled race called the UP200. And it's actually kind of a misnomer because it's 240 miles long. And it is a... Um, race that they run every year in February. It's actually a qualifier for the Iditarod. Does anybody know the history on the Iditarod? Okay. So way back in the day, there was an outbreak of diphtheria in Nome, Alaska, and there was no way to get the vaccinations from Anchorage up to Nome. They couldn't get in by air, and it was too cold. There was no railways to get in. So what they had to do was send it in by dog sled. So all these people came together and they ran a relay with 12 different teams of dogs that would run like 24 hours a day to get the vaccines up there in time to save the kids from this diphtheria outbreak, um, which is a testament to the human spirit. And they made a huge difference in that. But it's something that has continued on through this day. Balto is one of the most famous dogs. He was actually in the last leg of the race. So going back to the UP200, there was a musher back when I was a kid who got off the track. Um, I don't know whether it was because it was dark, because they run it through day and night, and they also run through ice storms. But he got off the track and got onto the ice where there was a thin patch of ice. So when he didn't show up at the next checkpoint, they went out with the snowmobiles and they went to look for this guy. They actually found his dogs barking on the ice. This man had broken through the ice and he had survived underwater for anywhere between 20 to 40 minutes because of how cold the water is up there. And that was something that even as a kid I just found fascinating because it was just suspended animation. Everything was so cold and it happened so quickly that even though he was underwater, he was alive 20 minutes later and he had good neurologic outcomes. Now that's not always the case and it doesn't mean that they're not a qualified musher. This is an example from 1994 where a guy who had already done the Iditarod, which is a 1,100 mile race in Alaska, he got off the trail and, and he ended up going through the ice. This person didn't survive, but uh, he died trying to cut loose his dogs and so they found him because the dogs wouldn't leave him. They were just barking on the ice. So going over uh, CPR by the numbers, because this is what it all starts with, right? Of all resuscitation attempts, only between 14 and 40% get return of spontaneous circulation. That's all comers, whether they're in hospital or out, ho out of hospital. But we have more literature on out of hospital cardiac arrests. Now of all patients who get ROSC, only about 24% survive until their hospital admission. And this can be affected by a lot of things. As I mentioned, we don't have a lot of information in the literature on in-hospital cardiac arrests. But where you have your cardiac arrest and who's near you says a lot for what your outcomes are going to be like. So if you end up having your heart stop and you die and you're at a gym frequented by doctors, you're going to do a lot better than if you're at a bar in the middle of nowhere with no access to doctors or you know, a fast way to get to the hospital. 
Of the patients who make it to the hospital for admission, only about 8% are going to survive with a good neurologic outcome to hospital discharge. Now, the neurologic outcome is the most important part because the number one cause of death in these patients after cardiac arrest is because they have neurologic dysfunction. Now, all said, of the 100% of patients that might have cardiac arrest, only 8% surviving, these numbers are terrible. I wouldn't I'd recommend this to most of my patients over age 65. But as physicians, we don't make the situation. We make the situation better. So let's go over a brief history of therapeutic hypothermia. When I say brief, I mean we're going to go back like 200 years. There is a really good article online published by Chess looking at uh, past, present, and future of therapeutic hypothermia. They give kind of a brief overview talking about back in the 1800s. There was some literature describing Russians that were uh, actually covering a patient in snow after uh, an event in order to try and obtain ROSC. Um, when Napoleon led his campaign into Russia, they actually documented using uh, ice packs and snow uh, to to provide analgesia for their injured patients and also to save uh, injured limbs on the battlefield. Jumping forward to 1954, Rosimov and Holliday, uh, two scientists, found a linear fall in cerebral oxygen consumption when they did uh, degree differences uh, dropping the temperature in their hypothermic dogs. After that, it kind of took off and it um, was looked at by the same group the next year when they found that um, every degree of body temperature somebody would drop, it would improve or it would directly correlate to their um, intracerebral pressure and also the brain volume due to vasoconstriction. So after that point, it really became something that was utilized by neurosurgery and we saw a lot more of it in the literature, um, got a lot more in depth. But the original studies by Rosimov and Holliday looking at dogs actually uh, were pretty useful. So I don't have any of the original images from when they were looking at the dog brain after uh, causing hypothermia, but in 1994 a group did a very similar thing after occluding the uh, cerebral artery in rats, and I do have images from that. So this is looking at rats that had occlusion of their um, middle cerebral artery, and then immediately following that occlusion they had a uh, hypothermia protocol that was done on them and it was either started immediately after or they could have up to a 60 minute delay and you can see that the rapidity of onset in this targeted temperature management had improved outcomes in the rat brains. So just to go over a quick question to get you thinking on the right track. You have a 58-year-old male who has a witnessed cardiac arrest. A bystander is able to initiate CPR and an automated external defibrillator is placed and delivers a shock. Then there's a return of spontaneous circulation. The patient's unresponsive and the decision is made to induce hypothermia to 33 degrees Celsius. Which is a potential complication of hypothermia? Do they have decreased systemic vascular resistance? Do they have a hypercoagulable state? Are they more predisposed to hypoglycemia, or are they likely to get hypokalemia? Just think about that while we go over the next things. So the effects of ischemia. When someone loses their pulse, within 10 seconds, they're going to end up having loss of consciousness because they're not perfusing their brain with enough oxygen to keep everything running. Within 20 seconds, their EEG is going to become isoelectric. At this point, their brain metabolism flips over to anaerobic glycolysis, and this rapidly depletes the energy stores and ATP that they have inside their brain. After that point, they have depolarizing uh, calcium channels and their ATP-gated channels aren't working, so they rapidly go into intracellular acidosis and have free radical production, which as you guys know leads to cell death. So that's the big problem neurologically when people go into cardiac arrest and why the timing is so important. The idea behind uh, hypothermia is that you'll have decreased cerebral blood flow because of vasoconstriction, and that will decrease your intracerebral pressure. We've also seen that patients have a mild decrease in their heart rate when they are hypothermic, they have increased systemic vascular resistance, and they have a decrease in cardiac output by about 7% per one degree Celsius of their core temperature that's dropped.
Patients who are mildly hypothermic are going to have increased renal perfusion, so you will see some diuresis in these patients naturally. And then along with having more diuresis and loss of potassium that way, they have increased uh, cellular potassium uptake. So their serum potassium levels are low. So be cognizant of that when you're watching your patients in the ICU. Things that are concerning when we do hypothermia protocols, they have decreased platelet function. And then hypothermia prolongs your PT and PTT, but that's mostly seen at more severe hypothermia. We're talking about less than 30 degrees Celsius, so not something that we do a lot. So bleeding isn't that much of a concern. But our patients do experience neutropenia, and they are therefore at an increased risk of having an infectious disease process, which is something to think about when you are doing um, invasive line placements for your cooling methods. So this whole thing kind of kicked off in 2002 when the New England Journal of Medicine published uh, an article by HACA, or the Hypothermia After Cardiac Arrest Study Group. They're gonna come up a lot, so remember that name. They produced this article on mild therapeutic hypothermia uh, used to improve the neurologic outcome after cardiac arrest. Now this was the first study of its time because before that we'd only been studying dogs and we'd only postulated that reduced cerebral oxygen consumption with other chemical reactions and physical mechanisms um, that slowing that down through hypothermia could benefit people. So this was a study looking at generalized cerebral ischemia following cardiac arrest and they were looking to see if cooling um, increased neurologic recovery. There was a lot of criteria to get into the study because it was the first of its kind. It was a randomized control trial People were blinded to outcome assessment. They looked at patients ages 18 to 75 who had a witnessed collapse. They also had to have emergency medical personnel attempting resuscitation within 5 to 15 minutes. So you essentially had to go into a V-fib arrest while inside the emergency room for another reason. It was very specific. And you had to have return to spontaneous circulation within 60, within 60 minutes. So these patients were cooled between 32 and 34 degrees Celsius for 24 hours, and again, that was just based off of prior studies looking at uh, animal models. But they did find that a mild hypothermia increased the rate of favorable neurologic outcomes, and it reduced mortality. So this was a huge landmark study. At the same time, uh, a guy named Bernard from uh, Melbourne, Australia, also published an article in the New England Journal of Medic Medicine called Treatment of Comatose Survivors of Out-of-Hospital Cardiac Arrest with Induced Hypothermia. <clears throat> this was also a randomized control trial comparing uh, normothermia to hypothermia in comatose survivors of cardiac arrest. Now in this study, they, only, they cooled specifically to 33 degrees Celsius, and they only did it for 12 hours. But they also noted they had a 49% survival in the hypothermia group as compared to a 26% survival in the normothermia group. So they did everything differently, but they had very similar outcomes, and they were amazing outcomes. So how important is the temperature? And how important is the rhythm that they're experiencing? And how long do you chill for? I had a lot of questions after reading all of this. So let's take it from the beginning. There are a couple different cooling techniques, but they're basically going to be either external or surface cooling, which is more basic. It's going to be able to be utilized in a wide variety of places, including out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, as opposed to internal or endovascular cooling techniques, which usually require a higher degree of training, and they usually have to be done inside the hospital. Now, looking at the external cooling, this is basic things like using ice packs or ice cold devices like the uh, gel pads that go on people's body to cover the surface area with a circulating low temperature fluid. You can also use cold wet towels. You can ventilate them with cooled air. And then you can also use water air cooled circulating mattresses or devices. So those uh, gel pads that go under the patient and circulate their temperature or essentially like a bear hugger on top of them that's blowing cold air. Now with the internal devices, one of them is pretty basic. You can just do ice cold IV fluids, and that's something that we can do out in the field, and you can even do it really rapidly to drop their, their 
core temperature. That doesn't require a lot of training, but once you get into things like endovascular catheters, those you're going to need some experience in the ICU, and things like extracorporeal circulation to drop body temperatures, you're going to need a perfusionist for that. You're probably going to need like a surgeon or someone who's qualified to put in ECMO catheters. And then lastly, although this isn't something that we necessarily think of when we talk about internal cooling mechanisms, medications. Now when they originally were talking about this in the literature, it seems more like they were referring to things like using Tylenol to make sure that patients weren't febrile, but it actually also includes things like using paralytic medications to ensure that the patients aren't shivering so that they aren't increasing their body temperature, and it gives them a much smoother uh, body temperature drop and also keeps it maintained at a lower temperature better. So which is the best? Uh, resuscitation published an article in 2018 comparing the four most commonly used uh, ways to cool patients and they found that the endovascular methods um, including the catheters um, or like ECMO as well as the gel adhesive pads cool patients more rapidly and more effectively keep them maintained in that target temperature range than other methods such as um, instilled saline that's freezing cold or doing like a mattress circulator with the cold water. Now already in 2015 a different group who published in resuscitation also uh, published on this topic and they were doing a head-to-head -head comparison looking at endovascular cooling mechanisms and they found that they weren't ex they weren't superior to using external mechanisms. So it's not really about how you're cooling the patient, it's about consistency, what tools you're able to utilize and what you're trained in. So if you're somewhere that you need to cool somebody and you're the only intensivist there, use gel pads if that's what you got. Don't try and do ECMO without a perfusionist or something ridiculous like that. That's going to make a bigger difference in patient outcomes and you're walking a pretty thin line. Also I want to comment that uh, resuscitation has published the majority of the articles that I use on this. Um, it's specifically dedicated to this issue, but it only has an impact factor of, I think, 5.3, so it's nowhere near what you're going to see with those first two articles that were published in NEJM in 2002. This is just a um, brief look at what using ECMO uh, would do. Uh, you're going to put in your catheters, have your roller pump, and then instead of using you know, your oxygen replacement and your CO2 sweep, you're going to run it through a heat exchanger that runs it past a cooling device, keeping your temperature much lower and much more consistent throughout because it runs through a computer monitoring program. And all the images that I use for this you could just find off of uh, Google. This particular one was published by the Medical University of Vienna. These are different examples of catheters that we use. Uh, most of them uh, just have an infusion port and then a port for the fluid to come back out and go through your cooling tank. This has serpentine coils up here that once it's in, you're going to have a constant supply of new cold water going past your blood. Same thing is seen down here. Only difference really is that this has three lumens. This one has five lumens, so it's about the size and you know what else you can use. Uh, for medication inflow because you don't do a lot of lines after you have somebody chilled. This is just another uh, example of essentially the same thing. You've got uh, cold fluid running through this. It almost looks like a metallic probe. And then these are all going to be femoral lines because you want them to be um, inserted into the inferior vena cava so that you've got maximum exposure to blood flow. And those can be confirmed uh, whether it's a metallic or any type of line just by doing a KUB. So the next question to get you thinking. A 63-year-old man with a history of diabetes, ischemic stroke, and dialysis-dependent end-stage renal disease has a cardiac arrest due to hyperkalemia from skipped dialysis and dietary indiscretions. CPR is promptly initiated and he has returned to spontaneous circulation within three minutes. He's now undergoing emergent hemodialysis with a MAP of 70 without vasoactive medications. He remains intubated but spontaneously opens his eyes although he follows commands inconsistently. For this patient, what's most important in his management? Do you want to achieve a core temperature of 33 degrees Celsius? Do you want to avoid having a PaO2 of greater than 300? Is it most important to insert an implantable defibrillator, or does he need maintenance of glucose between 80 and 110?
we're going to talk about temperature management now. Uh, back in 2001, there was an article published uh, in the Archives of Internal Medicine called Hyperthermia After Cardiac Arrest is Associated with an Unfavorable Neurologic Outcome. In this study, they found that hyperthermia worsens ischemic damage, and specifically they found that for each degree Celsius above 37, the risk of severe disability, coma, or having a persistent vegetative state was increased with an odds ratio of 2.26. That's huge. So even before the 2002 uh, studies were published in the NEJM, we knew that you don't want to be above 37 degrees Celsius. That's one of the most important pieces of information we have regarding temperature management, and that's going to come up later. So looking at targeted temperature management at 33 degrees Celsius versus 36 degrees Celsius after cardiac arrest, or the TTM targeted temperature management trial. This was published in 2013. This is a really well done study. The authors actually pre-published their protocol in order to let other people weigh in and address deficiencies or any biases that they might have so that they could fix it beforehand. It was designed to be a superiority trial because they hypothesized that being cooled to 33 degrees would have better benefit over being cooled to 36 degrees. They enrolled 939 unconscious adults post out of hospital cardiac arrest. I mean, that's twice the size of both of the 2002 studies combined. And it was really well done. So the information we got from that was that hypothermia to 33 degrees does not cause a reduction in all-cause mortality or improvement in neurologic outcomes when compared to 36 degrees. At this point, they changed the idea of therapeutic hypothermia to targeted temperature management because 36 degrees Celsius is just a little dose of hypothermia. And you got to know your audience. There is a. I'm sorry, what? What's normal thermia? So, normal thermia is anywhere from 36 to 38. Usually 37. Well, yes, but for this, they're saying that anything above 37 is going to be detrimental to the patient. So, as opposed to going for their targeted hypothermia, um, now they're just targeting a specific thing that's not necessarily hypothermic, it's just a little bit. So there is a group, we'll call them the temperature management after cardiac arrest group, who do um, updates maybe about every five years. They most recently published in Resuscitation in 2015, and they've got a super long name, so I just want you to remember them as the temperature management group. They did a review of the evidence, and they found that there's no good evidence to suggest that one target temperature within the 32 to 36 uh, degrees Celsius range is superior to another. Then in 2016, there was a comparison of therapeutic hypothermia and strict therapeutic normal thermia, as Dr. Guardiola points out, after cardiac arrest. Now this was a retrospective before and after cohort study. What they did is they looked at time that was spent within the first 24 hours in therapeutic hypothermia between 32 and 34 degrees Celsius and compared that to patients who had strict therapeutic normothermia and compared outcomes. Now between the two groups there was no difference in the time spent in range for their therapeutic areas and they found that strict therapeutic normothermia was safe and successful and it actually carried therapeutic benefits. So these patients used less sedatives and relaxing medications, they had less episodes of shivering, they also had less clinically significant bleeding, arrhythmias, and cardiovascular instability. So strict therapeutic normothermia may be a superior treatment option. So basically, the pendulum has now swung back. In 2002, we were looking at essentially colder the better, looking between 32 and 34. But now we're saying just as long as they don't have a fever, they're probably okay. Going further into that, there was a systematic review and meta-analysis done in 2018 looking at targeted temperature management after cardiac arrest. <clears throat> this group did uh, five randomized controls trials with over 1,300 patients looking at hypothermia versus normothermia, and they found that there's no difference in mortality or neurologic outcomes if it's hypothermia versus normothermia. And they actually suggest that therapeutic hypothermia may not improve mortality or neurologic outcomes in post-arrest survivors. 
So that's kind of changing the whole thought process that we've had for the last 20 years. <clears throat> So looking at the duration of targeted temperature management, we know that we want to keep patients cold, but how long is, is kind of a difficult thing to say. The targeted temperature management study only looked at 24 hours, and that was based on uh, dog studies that they previously reviewed. Now the targeted temperature management after cardiac arrest group that I mentioned, they thought that 24 hours is the least that you should cool somebody, but that was just based off of the week, it was just a week recommendation that was based off of the 2002 HACA group, as well as the targeted temperature management group from 2012. And then um, this is just another article looking at the same thing that found uh, temperature management for over 18 hours was an independent uh, predictor of favorable neurologic outcomes. Mm -hmm. That was published in 2012. Moving on to rhythm. Does your patient have a regular or irregular pulse and is it shockable? And how important is that? So going back to resuscitation, in I think this was 2012, they looked at mild therapeutic hypothermia and found that it was associated with favorable outcomes in patients after cardiac arrest with non-shockable rhythms. Now that was new. Previously it was all the VFib, VTAC arrest patients that we were able to shock. Now this was a cohort study based on cardiac arrest registry looking at patients from 1992 to 2009. They looked at over 3,300 patients who had constant temperature monitoring and were found to be between 32 and 34 degrees Celsius for 24 hours as previously advised. Since it was an observational descriptive study, it left itself open to selection bias since there wasn't any randomization, and they did comment that it's possible that uh, there was selection bias in the physicians as they enrolled their patients to be temperature management, to be temperature managed, sorry, um, and saying that patients who were expected to have bad outcomes probably weren't cooled. But the real meat of the paper is in this graph looking at hypothermia versus non-hypothermia patients. Up here in the non-hypothermia patients, you can actually see that not only are they in the normal range of about 37, they're actually going above that. And in the discussion of this article, they commented that a significant limitation to their study was the fact that patients who weren't treated with hypothermia actually tended towards hyperthermia, something that we knew from 2001 to be associated with poor outcomes. And here is uh, 38 degrees. Most of their patients were actually considered febrile within the first 24-hour window, the most crucial time in uh, post-cardiac arrest resuscitation. That can actually be brought back to the HACA study from 2002. This is their original uh, graph showing the hypothermia versus what they considered normothermia. Patients there also had a tendency towards being febrile within the first 24 hours. But if you look at it in light of knowing that patients should only be 37 degrees and knowing that every degree above that causes a 2.26 increased odds ratio of having poor neurologic outcomes, that changes everything about it. I mean, all of their normal thermia patients were essentially hypothermic and already outside of guideline temperatures. So maybe this data isn't that great. Maybe it's not the cooling that caused the benefits or the rhythm that the patients had experienced that caused them to have these benefits. Hard to say what is important. Looking at rhythms and outcomes of adults in hospital cardiac arrest, this was published in Critical Care uh, in 2010. This was a really well done study looking at the National Registry of CPR or the NRCPR. It was a prospective multi-site in hospital registry which was sponsored by the American Heart Association. So it's a pretty good database. They data mined for patients who were 18 years of age and older who had at least six months of data in the registry ranging from May of 1999 to July of 2005. They came up with over 55,000 patients and once they whittled it down for their criteria they ended up looking at 51,000 patients, just under 52,000. What they found was when you had VTAC, VFib, 37% of patients survived. Now this was as opposed to patients who were experiencing non-shockable rhythms, only 11% of them survived. But one of the most important things that this study found was actually the location that you're at when you have your shockable arrest is probably the most important indicator. 
Now, they specifically looked at a Las Vegas casino where there was close monitoring of all the people in there, and there were people nearby who had training in you know, BLS and maybe even ACLS, but could certainly use a defibrillator. And those patients were well enough to be gambling before they went into their V-fib arrest. So that kind of skews it. They had a 59% chance of survival. Now, they didn't actually give a number for patients who had in-hospital survival, but remember that this is an acutely different population. When they went into their VTAC VFib arrest, a quarter of them went into acute respiratory failure at the same time, and a quarter of them were experiencing acute hypotension. So these are the patients in the ICU that are crumping. You know they're about to code, and you're trying to prevent it from happening. You've got to remember, they're already sick. These patients were already admitted. A third of them were admitted for respiratory compromise, a quarter for congestive heart failure, and an additional quarter were admitted because they had renal insufficiency. So they were much sicker at baseline. One important thing to keep in mind for this was that this particular study found that 44% of all in-hospital cardiac arrests were VTAC or VFib. So that means that of all your cardiac arrests, half of them are going to be VTAC, VFib in the hospital, and a third of those are going to survive, making your in-hospital survival close to 16% which is not that far off from our original statement saying that about 8% of people would have survival after CPR. But I think the most important thing to get out of this is where you are and whatever your rhythm is plays a huge role in the outcomes. So it doesn't really matter what rhythm you have. It matters who's next to you and if they can provide life support and BLS. Or maybe it's more eloquently said by Sasson in 2010 when they stated that survival to discharge is more likely when arrest is witnessed by a bystander and is VTAC, VFib. Back to that same temperature management after cardiac arrest group. In their 2015 guidelines where they had said that there was no good evidence to suggest that one targeted temperature was superior to another, they basically said keep it below 37 degrees Celsius. And they said that the duration of uh, targeted temperature management should be at least 24 hours. They also went on to say that they recommend targeted temperature management as opposed to no temperature management on all out-of-hospital cardiac arrests who remain comatose, regardless of the initial rhythm, and for all in-hospital cardiac arrests, regardless of the initial rhythm. So no matter where they arrest, no matter what rhythm they have, do not let their temperature get above 37 degrees Celsius. We know that that's bad for the brain. So do targeted temperature management. Um, so timing is really important. We know that the time interval from collapse to ROSC is a strong independent predictor of neurologic outcome. But what about time to cooling? Looking at pre-hospital cooling versus in-hospital cooling, we know that Cold saline can be administered IV in the field and it can drop temperatures by an average of 1.7 degrees Celsius. That can decrease your time to targeted temperature management by an average of 93 minutes. Now in this particular study they were targeting 34 degrees Celsius but you can extrapolate from that. It's going to take off about an hour and a half to get you to whatever your targeted temperature is. But they found that pre-hospital cooling was not associated with an improved neurologic outcome. That's kind of in direct contrast to what we saw with the mouse brains. Sorry, rats. All right, back to the targeted temperature management cardiac arrest group. They recommended against pre-hospital cooling with rapid infusion of large volumes of ice-cold IV fluids following ROSC. Now, part of the reason for that was because we don't have any other cooling technique that was adequately studied in the pre-hospital setting, mostly because you need different levels of training. But they found no difference between pre-hospital and in-hospital cooling with regard to outcomes. So they say don't bother with it anyway, unless we have more studies telling us more information on that. And finally, uh, in 2018, that uh, review with meta-analysis, uh, they found that pre-hospital versus in-hospital hypothermia, uh, when looking at six randomized control trials with just under 34,000 patients, had no difference in mortality or neurologic outcomes. So things to consider. You want to cool people who had a witnessed out-of-hospital arrest. They can have any rhythm if they were in hospital. They want, you want them to be hemodynamically stable, and you want to get them started on their cooling protocol within six hours of rest.
Contraindications would be any other reason to be comatose, whether they uh, have drugs in their system, high levels of alcohol, or if they're in status epilepticus. Also uncontrolled bleeding, but this is kind of hard to say. That's more related to patients who have temperatures uh, of less than 30 degrees Celsius. They're going to have higher rates of bleeding. Um, but if it's a bleed that you can get under control within the first six hours, maybe you can cool them at that point. It's kind of clinical judgment. You're walking a fine line, and again, this is a life and death situation. So. The take home message, cool with whatever device is available that you're comfortable using. Keep them below 37 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. The rhythm may not be as important as we once thought. The important thing is knowing how long they've been down. A witnessed arrest is the best arrest.